Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching. In this video, we're gonna be talking about sign pricing. How much should I charge for that sign? Do you think that my price is too high? Am I leaving money on the table? I'm willing to bet that each and every one of you have at one point or another asked yourself this question. I want you all to imagine a world in your business where each and every time you are sending an estimate out, you know that you are pricing it accordingly, that you are pricing it according to your requirements, that you are going to be profitable, that you are not dramatically high, and that you are not dramatically low, that you're gonna be somewhere in here, which is where most of our customers like to shop. Sign pricing is not rocket science. There's no secret formula that you gotta stumble upon that's gonna get it right every single time. But imagine a world where you're not doing that internal dance with yourself where you're saying, oh, am I charging too much? Is it not enough? What? I don't even know how much money I'm making. Stop. Stop right now. Stop right now. In this video, I'm going to quickly show you the easiest way to price a signed product where you are not worrying about charging too much, you're not losing money, and you're also covering all of your costs with a bit of profit there built in, so stay tuned. In this quick example, I'm going to go through a really rough draft of how you can categorize how to price out a basic channel letter project. All right, so let's hypothetically say we have a channel letter project here, block letters that are gonna say pizza. Okay, you got five letters and they say pizza. Red letters, let's just call them 24 inches tall, mounted to a raceway, of course, and uh, it's gonna include everything, the permit, the installation, etc. But let's just talk about the actual product. Okay, so. So I like to coach other sign shop owners when it comes to let's do cost of goods sold first. What are the raw materials that need to be purchased to produce a five letter pizza sign with red letters, 24 inches tall? So let's go through it line item by line item. You're gonna need first some sort of aluminum backer. Some of you use Dibon, some of you use aluminum, 060 aluminum. Whatever the case is, you're gonna to need to know how many sheets of aluminum you're gonna need. So we'll start there. The second item, same thing, plexiglass or acrylic faces. How much acrylic pieces are you going to need? How much full sheets are you gonna need in order to produce this sign? Typically, the backs and the fronts go hand in hand. So if you need one sheet for the back, you're gonna need one sheet for the front. Now you're gonna need your channel letter coil. You know, the five and a half inch coil return that that pretty much makes the entire shape of the letter. Typically, if you don't have one in stock, these run for roughly about $250, $280 for an entire coil in this market. So you're gonna need to order one full roll, but you're gonna have a lot of waste left over that you can handle for other projects. So we're gonna talk about just using the actual amount that you need to order for this project. So right now we're gonna need one piece of, let's just say Dibon, one sheet of plexiglass. We're gonna need one roll of coil. We're also gonna to need to figure out how many LEDs we're gonna need. Now, we're gonna use red LEDs here, that's fine in this example, but how many trays or how many packs of 50 LEDs do we need for a uh, 24 inch pizza sign? So you'll figure that out, uh, you do some measurements, but if they're 24 inches, okay, typically here you're gonna use about anywhere between uh, 100 and 120 LEDs Depending if it's going to be obviously it's double stroke, I would always recommend going double stroke on your LEDs uh, just for integrity, for purposes of doing a sign job well done. Do a double stroke for every channel letter can that you could possibly do. But if you want to take uh, the, the easy road and do a single stroke LED, you know, probably in that 60 to 70 LED range as well. So that might be one, two, possibly three packs of LEDs, so you're gonna have your LEDs. You're gonna need your power drivers, your power supplies. Uh, probably 150 watt, just to be safe, one 150 watt. You're gonna need your junction box switches. 
This is going to go on a raceway. Are you outsourcing that raceway? Are you buying that from somebody like SignCop or another metal fabricator wholesaler? Or are you going to fabricate that yourself? If you are going to fabricate that yourself, you're going to need to figure out what the raw material you'll you're going to need to figure out what the raw materials are going to be to fabricate that raceway because you're going to need to know how much aluminum to get, how much, um, whether you build it with angle or aluminum tubing, steel tubing, whatever the case is, you're going to need to know how many sheets of raw goods that you're going to have to make to make that raceway. So finally, now you need your jewel light trim cap. Again, that like your coil is also going to come in a wheel. Once that wheel comes, you're probably going to have a lot left over. You're probably going to be able to get one, two, possibly three jobs out of a wheel at a time. So in this particular case, we're probably only going to go with one wheel. So there you have it. Those are all of my cost of goods items that I need for this particular project. Now, of course, there's going to be screws, rivets, silicone, resin bond, these are the items that you cannot account for. You cannot equate a cost to these. Sure, you could say a, a tube of silicone costs you five bucks, six bucks, but how many screws are you using? How many rivets are you using? How many staples are you using? That's very hard to determine, so that's why it's called indeterminates. So I say we take 7% about whatever the total cost of goods are going to be. You're going to take 7% of that number. You're going to get that number and you're going to add that to your total cost of goods. And that's going to give you the total cost of goods here. So here, here's your mock list of what your potential cost of goods are going to look like. So right here, we have your die bond backs, which are going to be somewhere around $50, your plexiglass, which is going to be $150 per sheet uh, for a four by eight sheet. You're going to have your coil, which is about $285, $290 there to be safe. You're going to have your wheel of jewel light, which is going to be about $50. You're going to have your LEDs. We're going to budget here three packs of 50, which is going to be about $150. You're going to have your power pack here, which is going to be about 150 watt guy at about 80 bucks as your total cost of goods for the actual letters. The raceway, we're gonna just choose here in this example to outsource that. It's gonna cost us about 500 bucks to make a, uh, a raceway here for this example. So that brings our total cost of goods sold to $1,270. Now what I like to do is take the cost of goods here and add that 7% in determinants fee. So that's gonna bring my total cost of goods here to 1358.90, just about just about $1,360 here for my total cost of goods for this job. Now, what I like to do here is take that $1,360, we're gonna round that up to the nearest whole dollar, $1,360, and I like to put some markup here on my materials. I like to take that percentage and times that by 1.5, and that's going to bring me to a price of $2,040 is what I'm going to charge the customer for the raw materials of this project. Okay, so let's take cost of goods and put it aside for a minute. We're gonna bring that back in a second, but now we need to talk about two things, and that's going to be your labor, and that's going to be your overhead. Okay, so in this example here, we're going to have just one person working on the entire job here from beginning to end. He's going to be your one stop shop guy, the guy that's going to handle everything from fabrication, running the machines, assembling it, doing all the wiring and getting it ready to be installed. So we're going to call our fabricator in this example, Joe. Joe, the fabricator is going to take for in this example, 25 hours to fully assemble this project. Now, that, now you might be asking, how did I come up with 25 hours? Well, great question. First of all, I'm taking that and I'm breaking it down incrementally. I'm talking about how long is it gonna take to route out the letters? How long is it gonna take to jewel light? How long is it gonna take to do the electrical? How long is it going to take to assemble, to do the mounting, to do the wiring, to do the electrical work? How long is it gonna take to assemble that raceway if I was fabricating it? How long is it going to take to paint if it's a, if it's a situation that there needs to be paint? So you know what? I forgot we're outsourcing this raceway, so it's gonna take a little bit less. So let's say 20 hours here. We're gonna take 20 hours. Now, what is Joe's hourly rate? Well, let's just say that Joe makes $20 an hour. 
Now, Joe's hourly rate to the company is $20 an hour, but an educated business owner knows that Joe doesn't cost you $20 an hour. There's a ton of burden rates that go along with Joe that make Joe a more expensive employee. Yes, Joe makes $20 an hour for himself, but how much does he actually cost the business? There are things like payroll taxes. There are things like income taxes, retirement, health insurance, vacation pay, training, uniforms. The list goes on and on of all of these associated costs that go towards Joe's employment. So what I like to do is I take about 15% of the total hourly salary and I break that down per hour. So in other words, I'm charging Joe $34.50 per hour to work for me because it's going to cover all of those other burden rates. So $34.50, we're just going to round that straight up to $35 an hour for this example. Okay, so Joe now is taking his time and he's taking 20 hours to work on this project. At $35 an hour, 35 times 20, that is costing the company $700 in total labor to produce this job. Now, I have a, t I have a $700 labor cost. What do I do here? I'm going to also mark this up but I'm gonna mark this up a little bit lower than 1.5. I'm gonna mark this up about 30%. So I'm gonna take my $700 and I'm gonna mark that up 30% by timesing that by 1.3 and I'm gonna to get to $910. Okay, we're almost there. Now I have to figure out what my overhead is going to be. I have to figure out what my overhead is going to be. Now I'm gonna take that 20 hours of working time and use that to my advantage here. But before I do, I have to kind of know already what my total monthly overhead is going to be. So let's just say I run a medium, small medium sized shop. My total bills every month, my electric, my phone, my POS system, my heating bill, uh, my rent, my cam charges, what have you, they come to somewhere around $7,000 per month. That might be a little low for some of you, but that's okay. You get the point. You can actually take your overhead cost, break that down per operating day, take that down per operating hour, and you'll get to the number that you need to get to. You'll get to your number, but in this example here, we're going to be using our number here, which is about $40 an hour for an average shop that has about $7,000 worth of overhead. Now remember, overhead does not include your payroll in this example. It's going to include every other business expense that you have recurring for your business, but you're going to break that down by the operating day and you're going to break down that number by the operating hour. So it, we typically have eight hours a day that we're working with here. So my number is going to be $40 per hour times 20 working hours. So 20 times four, uh, I'm sorry. So 20 times 40 is going to bring me to a total cost of $800 worth of overhead expenses that are gonna go into this project. So I'm going to have to take that $800 and add it to the 910 plus the 2070 from the cost of goods sold. So I'm going to have to take that $800 and add it to the 910, which was our labor, and then I have to take that number and add it to the 2040, the $2,040, which was costing us for all of the items up for this particular project. And now I'm going to get to a price of $3,780 for a channel letter sign. But what am I missing? What's the one word that I mentioned earlier? Profitability. You have to add your profit in. You have to add your profit in. In order to add your profit in, you have to decide. Typically, this is shown here on your profit and loss, what your net profit is at the end of the year. What are you trying to be at the end of the year? How, how much profit do you want at the end of the year in a percentage? Typically, I like to be anything above 15% here. I will. I, I enjoy a higher percentage profit and loss statement just like anybody, but I have to be realistic. We don't make 30, 40, 50% net profit on these types of jobs. So I have to make sure I maintain my profit margin. So in this example, I'm just going to take a quick 20% profitability margin here. Okay, so the way to do the final step in this mathematic equation is to take your cost of goods sold, your labor, your overhead, you add up all of those numbers together, 
And then you're going to divide it by the remaining number of what you want for your profit percentage. So in this example, we're going to take $3,780. $3, we want 20% profit. And we're going to divide that number by 80%. And you're going to get a number of $4,725 for the price of this job. So what I'm telling you is that at the end of the day, all of these items are going to be accurate. You can negotiate the prices down a little bit incrementally, maybe a few dollars of your cost of goods. Maybe you can tell your fabricator to speed things up a little bit and get things done less than 20 hours so that you can make more margin on this product. But you're budgeting 20 hours. You have all of these items. You got to watch your wastage there. That's why we mark those up a little bit. But at the end of the day, you're going to have a price here that you can feel comfortable with knowing that it's not too high. It's not too low. It's $4,725 for this example of a channel letter sign pizza at a 24 inch height per letter. Now, of course, just like any other project, you're going to have to add in all the extras. What's the price for installation? What's the price for your permitting? What's the price for surveying? You're going to add in all of those items to your estimate here, and you're going to get to a final price. But the principal point of this exercise is so that you can understand how to price a project like a channel letter sign, because you could use this formula for just about any other type of custom fabricated sign project in your business. It doesn't have to be channel letters. It could be anything. It could be an awning. It could be a carved sign, dimensional letters, pin mounted letters, what have you. If you're fabricating it yourself inside your shop, you can use this build a materials formula here to help you understand that this is where you need to be for a price and you can rest easy on your pillow at night knowing that you didn't give away the farm. You're not price gouging the customer. In fact, this is a very well articulated estimate. It's broken down by the same categories as your profit and loss statement. And that's what you can always rest assured because each and every primary category of your profit and loss statement, your cost of goods sold, your labor, your overhead, your profit are being accounted for in this example. Are you going to be confident in your pricing and know that each job that you sell has profit in it? You don't have to worry anymore. You don't have to ask yourself those simple questions from earlier in the video. That's what this video is all about. Make sure that you adopt this principle for any type of custom fabricated job. You will never go wrong with this type of logic. Now there are pricing spreadsheets out there that can help you, but Shopbox can also be programmed with the same logic. Once you have your materials in your lists and your prices there, you can mark those up automatically. Once you have established your shop rate with the Shopbox shop rate calculator, you can actually combine the number with your payroll or your labor with your overhead. And that's going to give you the number of the combined number of those two. So that's super easy. And all you got to do is figure out what your desired profit margin is going to be, what your desired profit percentage is going to be for your business. I'm Peter Karunas with Shopbox. I hope you learned a little something from this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. I love you guys. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget, stay positive out there.